Wicked land of volcanic mountains and devastating earthquakes. Most of the population is squeezed into some of the largest cities on the planet. Getting around the country is a challenge. Space for roads is restricted, and to move all the travelers by air, three jumbo jets would have to take off every five minutes. So the Japanese chose the train for mass transport. They transformed the humble train into an iconic and sophisticated engineering marvel. This is the N700 bullet train, latest in a line of pioneering high-speed trains. And, well, it even looks fast, which it is. Close on 200 miles an hour, 300 kilometers an hour in regular service. But if you think it's all about what happens here at the pointy end, you'd be wrong. It's much more radical than that. The whole thing is a system designed to get up to speed, then to corner safely and comfortably, even to stop automatically if there's an earthquake. It is quite a train. How do you turn a normal train into a bullet train? It starts with the simplest thing. The shape of the wheels. You would think the one place where a wheeled vehicle would have no problems at all is a straight piece of track like this. I mean, you've got wheels, rails, no bends. What can possibly go wrong? In fact, everything can go wrong if the wheels are the wrong shape. I mean, it's still round. Round is good in a wheel. But it's the part that touches the track here that makes contact. That is absolutely critical. Without the help of a medieval clock, a high-speed train could simply throw itself off the rails. No need to take my word for it because I've brought my very own carriage to the Hammond Railway's proving ground for its inaugural journey to test its wheels. It's not a grand design. It doesn't even have its own power, but that doesn't matter because I've got a powerful winch to drag it along this dead straight piece of track at speeds up to 50 miles an hour. Unfortunately, Hammond Railways don't stretch to basic amenities like seats. That's one of the reasons why I won't be riding on my carriage. The other reason is, well, it doesn't have any brakes. I did say it was basic. It'll be brought to a complete and probably quite sudden halt by that barrier down there. On the plus side, this does have everything we need to show just what high-speed train engineers are up against. Namely, we've fitted it with these train-style wheels. They're exaggerated, yes, but just like real train wheels, they're conical, angled where they rest on the track. They might look pretty odd, but according to Paul Allen, an expert in wheel dynamics, they'll show clearly what happens to real trains travelling at speed. Finally, Hammond Rail is offering a feature never before seen on trains, basketballs on poles. They'll show how the carriage moves. He's revving his V8 muscle car from 1970s. There he goes. As it speeds down the track at about 40 miles an hour, the carriage starts rocking from side to side. It's called hunting oscillation. Uh, I can see. Yeah. Is that why the, yeah, the top of these posts are moving side is, to side? Yeah, you can see it hunting a bit now. That's not gone at all well for it, has it? That's a bad thing. The kind of thing you need to avoid <laughs> in a real train. And this isn't just a problem for Hammond Rail. Real trains have derailed on straight track, and the repeated sideways movement can also damage the track itself, like this one in Germany. Wobbling along a dead straight track is the fault of those cone-shaped wheels. 
So they don't seem like such a good idea. Why aren't they flat? Well, the problem with flat wheels is we need to get round a curve. Yeah. So if we try and do that with flat wheels, right. I've got my flat wheel here. We run it down the track. See, it works. It doesn't uh, work. It doesn't work. So much. Yes, but we all know train wheels, they're, they're round, but then they have like a flange on them that keeps them in the track. Flanges are the metal lips that sit down the side of the tracks. We could put flanges on the wheels, but the trouble is then the wheels will be guided around the curve purely on these flanges, and we'll wear them out, and we'll wear the size of the, the rails out, it'll all be wrecked. Very quickly. Very quickly, yes. So, it's back to those conical wheels. Someone uh, clever came along and thought, well, if we put some cone angles, then we might be able to get this to go around a curve. Go on, then. Somebody came up with this. OK. So it's off, that's where the other one got to. And it's just... Well, it works. It works. Clearly. And that's just its shape. Exactly, yes. sending it round. A cone rolling on its side turns in a circle, and train wheels use this principle. As it goes round a bend, the train is thrown out, and the outside wheel effectively gets bigger, making a sort of cone which turns the train. But because conical wheels can effectively change size, they can make trains unstable, even on straight track, causing that hunting oscillation we saw, especially at bullet train type speeds. The solution is an engineering compromise. So what we try and do is we get just the right amount of cone angle to get us around the curves we need to get around, but no more than that. So but there yes, will be an optimum amount of slope, cone, Yes. For a train that's going to go faster. Yes, so very high speed trains have very low amounts of cone angle or conicity, and slower trains have much more conicity. So the slope on a conventional train wheel is flattened for the bullet train. The angle is halved. Each wheel is precision machined to the perfect angle. And what's good enough for a bullet train is good enough for Hammond Rail. I'm exchanging my extreme conical wheels for flatter ones. I've also added some weight to try and stop it derailing again. I'll admit Hammond Rail doesn't offer a complete service yet. No return tickets. You have to push yourself back to the station. Inconvenient, but cheap. Here he goes. So what we're looking for here is a steady ride. Nice ride, low hunting. That's perfectly happy. That is going quick, actually. God, that really is moving. The stopping's going to be uncomfortable, obviously, in a real, a real situation. The flatter wheels have eliminated hunting oscillation. Look how steady the basketball telltales are. My carriage travels straight and true on the rails, which means it can go really fast. But still nowhere near as fast as a bullet train. For those kinds of speeds, the engineers couldn't just rely on flatter wheels to avoid hunting oscillation. They needed a two-part solution. The second part of which lay at the heart of a medieval clock. Before clocks were invented, time was pretty fluid. But medieval monks wanted regular prayer times. They needed precise clocks. And that particular prayer was answered for them around the middle of the 15th century with the invention of a new type of clock. And the device that transformed clock making, monastic life, and ultimately the bullet train was this, the coiled spring. There's one in here, in this clock as well. All it does as you wind it, it coils itself around itself tighter and tighter, and that's storing energy. Then as it unwinds itself slowly, that energy is released, and it's that energy that's used to turn the gears and cogs that turn the hands and tell us the time. And with a little bit of tweaking, this horological motor would go on to help solve the problem of hunting oscillation on the bullet train. Because coiled springs are also good for suspension systems. 
By stretching and squashing, they smooth out bumps in the road, as car mechanics discovered in the early 20th century. And train engineers adopted the same idea. Coiled springs, in fact, are particularly good for trains because they don't just absorb up and down motion. They also dampen side to side rocking. On the bullet train, coiled springs absorb the energy of the hunting oscillation. Stiffer springs absorb more energy, so they dampen the sideways movement so the train can't rock as violently. Right, they are actually building trains here, so I'll get out of their way. Thanks to some punctual monks and clever watchmakers, the engineers were able to design a train undercarriage that stops it hunting, shaking from side to side at high speeds. With flatter wheels, the train rolls so straight that it wears an almost perfect line along the rails. The machining of the wheels is the beginning of the journey for the bullet train. It ends up like this, a brand new bullet train. And once built, it's ready to take its first high-speed journey. I wonder if they've left the keys in. <laughs> Here it is, the business end. I'm guessing flat out at uh, what? Close to 200 miles an hour, 300 kilometers an hour. Being a train driver is quite exciting again. This might be in the workshop, but it is actually wired up and ready to go. It'll be driven out of here. But not now, not by me. Probably just as well they didn't leave the keys. But what happens when you do switch the train on? To move at all, let alone reach breakneck speeds, the bullet train needs power. And it gets all the power it needs in the form of electricity from overhead lines. The connection between the wire and the train is this device along here. The pantograph. So electricity flows in through those few square centimetres where it touches the wire and from there down into the train. To feed enough power, engineers faced a choice between a faster or a bigger electrical flow, stepping up the voltage or boosting the current. In a lab that looks more like the set of a sci-fi movie, Manchester University professor Ian Cotton shows the demands big currents make. So, Ian, talk me through this. I'm guessing current is going to go around there somewhere. Yes, yeah, so we have a transformer from the mains, and in this loop we get a high current. All right. Well, fire it up, then. Is it working now? It will do. You'll see the numbers on the ammeter go up, so that means we're getting more current flowing through the loop. So this is the quantity of amps flying through here. Oh, oh, hang on, look already. This wire is getting hot. What's happening? High amps, a big current, overload the thin wire. It heats it up to the point of complete failure. So if you have very, very high currents, you need to use a very big piece of metal to let the current flow. So for our train, we'd need much bigger than this? Absolutely. It would be very, very big and very, very heavy. To carry enough current for the bullet train, the overhead wires would have to be huge, thicker than a man's arm, and enormously expensive. Totally impractical for train lines that run for hundreds of miles. The only other way to give the train the juice it needs was to up the flow the voltage. Train lines usually carry 1,500 or 3,000 volts, nowhere near enough for a bullet train, so the engineers increased it to 25,000 volts. But with such a gigantic voltage, any break in the circuit between the wire and pantograph can be catastrophic. The pantograph has not just one job, really, to maintain that contact with the wire overhead, but it is quite an important job because lose that contact and you lose 